Okay, here we're to another episode of On The Rest Off The Cuff. Today I have a really special review for you guys from the brand Seiko. A little about them. They were founded back in 1881. They are Japanese in origin and now have factories throughout Asia. They cover all market segments from entry level to high end. And in terms of the type of watch, I'd consider this a traveler's watch. Some key common characteristics and language. You're looking for something uh, within this genre. Of course, you're going to want either a GMT or a world timer function. So you're able to track multiple time zones with relative ease. This is part of their pro specs line and it is their land mechanical gmt s pb 411 navigator timer reissue and it's a faithful recreation of the 1968 seiko 6117-8000 8, um, that was really the brand's for it, very first gmt style watch with a rotating bezel you guys can get these for fifteen hundred dollars msrp and that's full price i sourced this one locally through belmont watches located in san diego big shout out to belmont as always for coming through and uh, I know this will probably be a divisive piece for some fans and this will be a piece that was probably long awaited for others and uh, and I kind of see both sides of the camp and hopefully this uh, you know this video will help shed a little bit more light in terms on where this piece kind of lays in terms of value proposition now with all that said let's go ahead zoom the camera out get this piece in hand and take a closer look Okay, guys, now I do have a quite a few other watches here today, um, you know, for starters, last year's most worn watch, my Slim Turtle SPB317. Um, some of you probably recognizing the family uh, resemblance there in terms of that DNA. Uh, also, another reissue from this year is going to be this Seiko 5, uh, I believe it's the S. PK17. Um, I probably got that wrong, but it's the Seiko 5 reissue of the original Seiko 5, and I do have it on this period correct Forstner um, bullet uh, bracelet, and I think it looks absolutely great. And again, you're seeing some family resemblance. And here I have my beloved and prized SLA017, which more so uh, I, I wanted to kind of bring in as a comparable because of one, the dial color and how signature that is to the history of Seiko, as well as talking about some of the higher end Seikos that have become quite expensive um, and out of reach for many folks. I wouldn't say they've become, they've kind of always been. I mean, you got to think about Marine Masters and Tunas have always been quite expensive. But um, when we get into kind of this modern SLA line here, even though this is from 2017, um, this is, you know, not necessarily uh, considered an affordable watch for most folks that may be into collecting Seiko watches. So I did want to bring that in because this watch here, this beautiful navigator timer reissue kind of bridges the gap between all of these watches, which I think is really, really cool. So a little bit about this piece, guys. 38 and a half millimeters in diameter, 12.8 millimeters thick, and 45.2 millimeters lug to lug, brushed and polished stainless steel, guys, with that, of course, super hard coating known as Dia Shield in Japan. It does have a fantastic box domed sapphire really gorgeous as you can see with a super clear inner AR coating so even when you do get some glare you're not going to be getting any uh, different types of colors or anything disrupting the colorways of the dial now this bezel is going to be bi-directional and friction fit with a 24 hour scale there so that if you do decide to maybe try another time zone you can just do that by scooting over the piece by what, however many hours you're gonna be going ahead or back. So very nice and solid in terms of that friction fit. Now, getting into the crown, it is this is something that I think a lot of people were concerned about, especially those of you who may have experienced this crown. One of the big differences that you guys can see from the Seiko 5 versus this Prospects model is that the Seiko 5, and much like the hooded lugs, it also kind of hoods that crown. So you really only have that one area to grasp and to wind so it is a little bit uh you know 
uh, particular to wine that you just kind of roll like this and of course that's putting some undue stress so you don't want to do a lot of winding like that but one of the nice things as you guys can see here becomes less of an issue because the top part of this crown is exposed it's also larger as you can see not that much larger but large enough to wear and also it's slightly shorter and it has a lot more in common with this crown which is amazing on this slim turtle if you guys can uh, let that focus as you can see very easy to grasp of course much larger uh, screw down crown so you're not going to be able to just wind it from that position you would un uh, you would unscrew it but here being a push pull crown you're able to just wind it within this position and that's actually really really very easy to wind so very nice so if those were you that were you know maybe a bit concerned about that aspect definitely don't worry now getting into the movement uh, although you can't see it underneath this very nice period correct case back check that out very similar to the period correct case back here found on this Seiko 5 model Check it out with the horseshoe layout there. Very cool. We're seeing that again here. Um, inside here is going to be the Seiko 6R54 uh, GMT movement. And it's a collar GMT, the original movement uh, for this watch. It's not this watch, but the watch that inspired it. Uh, of course, it didn't have any independently adjustable uh, extra hands. Uh, the extra hand was slaved to the hour hand, so it was more of an AM PM indicator until you use this great invention here, being that sliding bezel. Here you can do the same thing again, or if you wanted to, you actually do now have an independently adjustable 24 hour hand, which has a better use case, or I should say a more intuitive use case if you are using it as an office or a caller style GMT versus a traveler. The nice thing though is because of this easily rotating uh, bezel, you can actually use it as a traveler very easily because depending on where you travel, you're just gonna go ahead and set it however many hours forward or backward and you can just leave everything as is and you don't even have to change the position of that and you'd be still good to go so i do like that feature set and so it does still make sense would have been nice to get a you know a proper uh flyers gmt sure it would have been nice but it also would have meant uh, it would have increased the pricing. And I also, me personally, I already have a Grand Seiko GMT, my SBGM245, so I don't really need another flyer. Now, one of the really nice perks of this being the 6R54 versus one of their 4R based movements is that this gets that elongated uh, power reserve. So this is going to have a 72 hour, three day power reserve. And the nice thing is it's not printed across the dial, not very flashy, no billboarding, three Hertz, 21,600 vibrations per hour beat rate. So that is to be expected kind of within this range, right? That's what you're going to be getting, of course, in the slim turtle. That's what you're going to be getting on this Seiko five. Um, you're really going to have to pay up if you wanted to get something with a smoother sweep than that, right? Um, so very nice. And then we get into the details, guys, uh, applied indices and an applied logo, which is something you're not even getting on that SLA, mainly because uh, it's within the prospects line and it's a diver. What they like to do is really make sure that they're very robust and that there's less things to fail so they don't do the applied logos anymore. So this is actually one of the few applied logos you're going to find within the Prospects line, which I think is very, very cool and another nice little nod to their heritage. You're also going to have that beautiful sunray gray dial with the date at the three o'clock position, which does have a nice beveling, not quite as nice as the originals beveling there um, in terms of the depth of the dial, but it still is beveled on the edges there, which I can appreciate. They could have easily just done a cutout. They didn't do a cutout and I'm really thankful for that. Same goes for this bezel insert. They did a brushed steel insert, although I believe the original was more so just an aluminum uh, that had, you know, uh, that was just gray and then had black printing on it. So they did do things to turn it up quite, uh, you know, to another level of really, really nice quality for your money. Now, of course, you're going to have uh, this beautiful, <laughs> 
pop of red in terms of that red painted GMT hand. And you're also getting two tone finished handset there in terms of having one that uh, one side that's going to be high polished and the other side that is going to be matte brushed. Also, you have a very elegant seconds hand there without any lollipops or stop lights or anything on it. You can see just flowing beautifully. And again, this isn't a dive watch, um, so you don't really need to have that running seconds going. It's not really a requirement for something that you're going to be wearing more as an everyday piece or just even as a traveler's or office watch. Now, the lugs here are going to be 19 millimeters, which is fine by me. That's what you're going to get with the more expensive SLA. And you're getting a really nice bracelet, guys. It is a uh, flat link style, as you can see, and actually quite um, comparable to the original, but just built way better. And of course, covered in that Dia Shield hard coating. A really nice treat that not really anybody's mentioned is the clasp. So the clasp itself actually has a trick that we've seen on Grand Seiko clasps, as well as within the Sharp Edge series clasps, uh, being that it does have that little overhang there, so that when it does meet, it does just look a little bit cleaner. So I can appreciate that, and you can see these pushers here are nice and robust. You do have two positions of micro adjust, where uh, I will say that because of how crowded it is with that buckle interface there, um, it is a little tight in terms of trying to get to use that closer one. I tried on initial kind of setting and I didn't want to finish, you know, mess around with it too much. So I just left it at that outer setting. Um, but you can see nicely chamfered and uh, contoured in terms of this folding mechanism so that's going to lay nice and comfortable against the wrist and this is really well articulated very short links guys you can see here essentially the links are the same length as what would be a half link in another watch this actually reminds me a lot of my um my king seiko bracelet which that is an expensive watch as well so uh this has a lot of good you know good things going on oh one thing to mention although it's not a dive watch it does have 100 meters of water resistance or 10 bar which is great um and i think that is something that does help with that everyday versatility now before i get it on wrist some things i just want to mention here in terms of kind of where this lays within uh, the lands of other watches of course if you really do like the slim turtle uh, but maybe feel it's a bit too utilitarian also it doesn't come with let me give it a quick little wipe here um, I'm not crazy about the bracelet option for it and so you know I have to pay a little bit more to get this genuine tropic strap which is what I recommend um, on this piece and it really wears fantastic oh, a little smudge there still sorry um, and I really, really do love this piece. But at the end of the day, it is definitely, um, I think one of the comparisons, of course, is the SPB143, which has a more 62 MAS style dial uh, layout, which is going to be something that people really like that more kind of luxurious uh, aesthetic and something that just looks like it's a bit more complex and just tries a little bit harder in terms of uh, just being quite impressive. And if you like this case, guys, and you like the wearability and all that, and now you can get something even smaller. It's a, f a beautiful 41 millimeter. Um, now that you're getting into the 38 and a half, and that is just gonna wear even better. Now, here, of course, being uh, a very nice, uh, you know, affordable type of piece, it, it's just really beautifully done, but you're not gonna get sapphire, right? You're gonna be getting a single curved hard lex. Also, this is gonna be, um, you know, although true to form, it, it's not gonna be quite as useful daily um, just because of that, you know, it's a bit of a compromise. And again, the bracelet, uh, the OEM bracelet isn't the greatest, it's not the worst, but you end up spending a little bit more money to get something on a bracelet. Here, I mean, even if you look at the SJE model uh, variation, most recent recreation of the 62 MAS, it doesn't come with a bracelet. Um, so here, you know, you're, again, it's for you to try to achieve something like this that feels very special. Man, this comes very close and you're getting that smaller sizing if you do have smaller wrists. And if you have larger wrists, this thing just still fits quite beautifully. Speaking of that, let's go ahead, get it on the wrist and see how it wears. 
Okay guys, as you can see on my seven and a half inch wrist, this just wears glorious. And again, it's probably a little bit smaller than you might expect for a watch in terms of visually for something that's gonna be 38 and a half millimeters with a rotating bezel. But somehow that magic just works really well. Of course, if I get my wrist a bit too close to the camera lens here, actually, let me give it a quick little wipe off there. Um, it's going to appear a bit distorted in terms of your perspective and it's gonna look a little bit larger. So what I like to do is keep my wrist nice and low and then just tighten up the frame here so you guys can get still a detailed look while just getting a bit of a truer aspect ratio as to how this melee on your own wrist. Ah, now of course I'm noticing a little bit of dust. Give it a little dust off here. All right, ooh, check that out guys. All the tricks, all the bells, all the whistles, the things that you love about Seiko are here. And you're getting a fantastic bracelet. You're getting that Dia Shield hard coating. You're getting that beautiful box domed sapphire. And I know some of you are thinking 1500 bucks, but 1500 bucks for a fully in-house watch with a Seiko movement. Some people are gonna argue, well, you can get watches with Seiko movements. Yeah, sure you can, but they're not Seikos. And the ones that you can, Guys, uh, you know, go ahead. That's cool. Get a Seiko 5. You don't have to get this. This thing is sweet, though. It's nice. You know, you just like with cars, you don't, not everybody has to have the Halo model. Not everybody has to have the Collect. Not everybody needs to drive an M3. Some of you will be perfectly happy with a 3 Series. Some of you will be happy with a Z. You don't need a Nismo Z. You don't need, um, you know, a GTR. That's fine. It doesn't mean you can't appreciate nice things. Then my goodness, this thing is nice. Check that out. It just plays with the light in such a great way and it just looks fantastic. And you guys can see, even though I have a seven and a half inch wrist, which is on the larger side, I do have quite a thick wrist, right? A round wrist. So um, it's not like it's flat and wide where it's just gonna accommodate to every watch. This is really nicely centered and gives you those wonderful vintage vibes. Um, while still being extremely wearable, which I really, really dig. So with that said, let's go set up for some loom shots, low light transition and closing thoughts. Okay, let's go ahead and hit the lights here. All right, again, not a diver, but still has loom bright loom, which is absolutely fantastic. Very, very nice. Let's go ahead and work in a little bit of low light transition because you know, you're not always gonna be out in the middle of a field enjoying direct sunlight. A lot of times you're gonna find yourself coming in and out of buildings, walking underneath overhangs, or just hanging out underneath the shade of a tree, maybe spend some time in your favorite automobile. So it is nice to see what these colors, textures, and finishes render like in less than optimal lighting to maybe even include a little bit of harsh lighting, which could expose any types of production defects. But all you're gonna see here is nice uniform flow of lighting. Uh, so this thing looks great, guys. And I will say the Dia Shield coating on here is not intrusive. It doesn't make the whole watch look super dark or anything like that. It still has a nice rendering of steel uh, in terms of the brightness. So very, very handsome. And that dial, guys, it really plays well. And that more monochromatic uh, look is also something that helps this wear so nice on wrist, especially if I have a larger wrist because now that dial is going to flow with the bezel and flow with the case versus let's say if this dial was black, if the dial was white or blue, it would then draw your eye to the small diameter of the center of the dial and the bezel, making the rest of the watch appear a little bit smaller. So a lot of fun tricks here, but man, they just work for me, guys. They, they really, really do. So on the wrist wears absolutely perfectly. It just captures that vintage aesthetic without seeming at all undersized, which is nice. It also airs like that kind of SLA slash SJE like premium feel, which I can appreciate. Again, this bracelet, the closest comparable I could say is it reminds me of my uh, uh, beautiful 6L powered King Seiko uh, bracelet, which that is like a $3,000 watch. So, um, that is high praise uh, from that perspective. Now, in terms of comparable models, yes, the GMT space has become super crowded since the release of the Seiko Instruments NH34, as well as the Miyota 9075, joining the Swiss mainstays like the Sleda SW330 and ETA 2893. 
but you still have to appreciate the fact that this is a fully in-house Seiko movement in a historically accurate Seiko design. You're just not gonna find that. Sure, you can get in-group offerings, but they're not really cheap either, right? If you think about, let's say, a Belova that has a Miyota GMT movement in it, it's not gonna be much cheaper, if cheaper at all, when you think about full MSRP and anything else, it's not like they're in-house ETAs, uh, you know, sure, you can get something within the swatch group. That's in group. That's not in house, right? Um, Salida doesn't make watches either. So, but you know, those movements are great. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with the 9075 or the NH34. I have watches with literally all of these movements in them, and and I appreciate them very, very much. And one thing to remember before everybody starts bagging on the fact that this isn't a true or a traveler style GMT with a jumping hour hand, guys. There are still brands like Breitling selling $7,000 ETA 2893 collar GMT movements. Uh, so you can't like, those watches are still selling. Again, like for like six, seven, eight thousand $8,000, this is 1,500 and this is gorgeous, right? And it's really, really beautifully done and it is fully in-house down to Seiko making the jewels, Seiko growing the crystals, Seiko uh, having their own uh, lubricants, guys. So, I mean, come on. It's just, I think everybody kind of will compare to, oh, well, there's these other things that are out there. Yeah, but they're not one-to-one -one comparable. You're going to have some level of trade-off and that's fine. Not every watch, again, has to be for everyone. And this is a limited watch, even though it's limited to 4,000 units, um, which really tells you that, you know, in the next two to three years, this thing will end production versus it being something where it's just like, hey, you know, FOMO required. But the nice thing is they're letting you know that this will end production. So if you are saving for it, then save for it um and uh but just don't wait too long to pull the trigger because then eventually you'll have to go to the secondary market and that's fine maybe you'll save some money on the secondary market not everybody needs to have things bright and shiny and new when they buy them that's one of the beautiful things about the vintage market so uh guys bottom line here this might just be the perfect sweet spot between those $3,000 and up SLAs and SJEs and your typical $1,000 prospects reimagining. But here you're getting a reissue, not a reimagining. Um, and then, you know, to compare it to that reissue of a Seiko 5, which is a wonderful sweet spot as well at under 500 bucks, here you're going to get Sapphire. Here you're going to get, um, you know, a little bit more in terms of, hey, having that hard coding having that ar coding so uh the extra nice bracelet that you don't even need to swap out which is pretty amazing right um so let's say you love the sla 01762 mas reissue but found it too expensive or you love the spb 317 slim turtle but found it a bit too utilitarian this spb 411 really bridges the gap giving you something that feels super special while still being very wearable every day Oh yeah, and as a bonus, it's also super handsome and perfectly proportioned as well. So you have that going for you. So with all that said, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. If you liked the video, please do a like. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe for more content just like this. Thanks, guys.